Case Western University, August the 24th, 1975. 40,000 books and 50,000 maps were turned into a soaking mess as heavy rainstorm water leaked into a library. The New Jersey archives, fall 1980. Supreme Court records, briefs, and transcripts were ruined despite swift response to the fire. Hollins College, fall 1985. More than 30,000 of the college's 230,000 volumes were damaged in a flood. How does it happen? Well, natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods and the like certainly account for part. But also, buildings leak, pipes burst, and sprinkler systems malfunction, which may result in both fire and water damage. And there's always the threat of arson. After a recent law library disaster, the firm's partners wanted to replace just the heavily used materials. They were unprepared for the estimate, over a million dollars to replace only those essential items. In contrast, a broken water main drenched 52,000 volumes in the Meyer Library at Stanford University. The final direct cost to Stanford University was approximately $125,000, or about $4.86 per volume. This involved all costs associated with the disaster. The project was completed in 13 months. In this case, only 34 volumes could not be salvaged and returned to the shelves. Why? Because those who bore responsibility for the materials knew how to react to a disaster. As an administrator, you have the ultimate responsibility for your collection and must be aware of the catastrophe water and fire could wreak upon your collection. It's essential for you to be able to react quickly to a disaster with well-proven methods, adequate resource information, and a written disaster prevention and recovery plan. Many people who seek disaster assistance have little knowledge of the steps to take or the resources available to help them. This video and the accompanying manual provide this information. Library, archival materials, and other records risk tremendous potential damage as a result of a disaster caused by fire, water, or a combination of the two. The most important thing you can do is establish a contingency plan for such a disaster. The purpose of this video and the accompanying manual is to illustrate proven procedures for dealing with a disaster as well as giving you resources to draw upon, both prior to and in the aftermath of a disaster, and to furnish resources which are available to assist you in the recovery of water damaged library materials and records involving books, periodicals, manuscripts, prints, office files, as well as photographic materials, including microforms. First, establish priorities for all categories of materials. Time wasted salvaging, run of the mill, magazines, newspapers, periodicals, and records could mean loss or aggravate damage to special collections or research materials. Be certain that you are adequately insured. In addition, be certain that you know what information and records your insurance company will require to process your claims. Photographs of the damage are very helpful. You may need a separate legal agreement with your insurance company to gain immediate access to the damaged area. Many states, counties, universities, and insurance companies have their own risk managers. Risk managers are a valuable source of information concerning fire prevention and fire extinguishing systems and can advise you on the areas where those and other potential hazards exist, such as faulty wiring, leaking roofs and clogged drains, need for sprinkler systems, lack of heat, smoke and water detectors, and faulty plumbing. Fire usually causes more permanent damage to materials than water since combustion is rapid and its effects may be irreversible. In the case of fire, though, there will be time to evaluate the extent of damage, time to make decisions regarding the dispositions of materials which may have only been partially scorched but may still be salvageable. Charred volumes can often be trimmed and rebound. If the fire damaged books are still in print, replacement may be advisable. Manuscripts that are charred or have been subjected to extreme heat should be delivered intact to a conservator. Microforms or photographs will probably be ruined if they have been exposed to the extreme heat of a fire. 
Water damaged books and records should have recovery action taken as soon as the problem is discovered. The damaged material should be removed from the disaster site within 48 hours. The sooner the recovery begins, the greater the prospect for success. The librarian should survey and determine the extent of the damage to materials. Then the salvage team should be assembled, consisting of the librarian, a qualified library or archival conservator, if possible, a workforce of library staff members, an electrician, plumber, and custodial support. Brief the team on the overall recovery process. The primary objectives are to stabilize the condition of the materials before moving them and to salvage the maximum number of materials while minimizing the restoration and rebinding costs. A central command center should be set up to act as a headquarters from which the recovery plan may evolve. Top priority should be given to recovering the shelf list and the card catalog or other records which list or describe the collection. Avoid any action which might remove or blemish identifying information or labels. If possible, have a duplicate set stored off-site. One individual should be taking incoming calls and be placing calls to make the necessary arrangements outlined in the plan. Clear the aisles between the stacks and inspect the affected areas for signs of mold development. The warmer and more humid the environment, the faster mold will develop. To combat mold development, the area should be properly ventilated. Fans, dehumidifiers, air conditioning, and all possible venting should be employed. In addition, commercial dehumidifiers are available and may be rented. If mold does start to grow on material, immediately freeze and then dry it. Arrange to have the material fumigated when drying is complete, since freezing will not necessarily kill the mold. Fumigation is best accomplished as the final phase of the vacuum drying process. Once books are dry and fumigated, mold or mildew can generally be more easily removed. Do not attempt to remove mold or mildew from wet books. Wiping will only rub mold into the book's cover or pages. If the mold is found over a large area of the collection, then fungicidal fogging may be necessary before the removal of the material to a freezing facility. Never attempt fogging unless supervised by a qualified technician. Information regarding fogging is included in the manual accompanying this videotape. In preparation for freezing, a relay of workers should be formed between the damaged area and an adjacent dry work table area. All work tables should be covered with plastic sheeting. As volumes are taken from the stacks, a log of range, section, and shelf location should be kept. Volumes moved to the work area should be placed on tables with an index card in front of each group indicating location by range, section, and shelf. This information should be recorded in a notebook or onto a log form. In the left-hand margin of the log form is an area for sequential numbering. These numbers will later be transferred onto the containers as the material is packed prior to freezing. A sample of the form is in the accompanying manual. Another group should work as a team to wrap and package the materials. Damaged materials which can be saved should be given priority before either undamaged or completely ruined materials. Covers of water-soaked books should not be removed. Where single sheets have stuck together, no attempt should be made to separate them. They should be frozen and vacuum freeze-dried. Then they'll separate easily. No attempt should be made to clean any materials, whether they are bound or in loose sheets. Wet manuscript boxes holding papers, prints, drawings, maps, or office records may be repacked in dry boxes prior to freezing or wrapped in freezer paper and frozen. They may also be put into plastic bread trays and interleaved with freezer or wax paper. Wet records in file cabinets should be removed and put into milk crates or cartons and interleaved with wax or freezer paper. Books with glossy paper, such as the National Geographic magazine, must not be permitted to dry. When dry, the pages become permanently fused together. Give these items a high priority if they must be salvaged. Salvageable books should be wrapped in freezer or wax paper in the exact condition in which they're found. Each volume should be wrapped individually, 
to prevent them from adhering to one another when frozen. The paper should extend beyond the top and bottom of the book. Do not wrap the book completely. Books may be placed either in plastic milk crates or heavy cartons. Milk crates are preferable as they're stronger, easily stacked, and material will freeze quicker. Books should be packed firmly, but not tight, with the spines down. They should not be packed flat, as this will retard freezing. Before packing, holes should be punched in the sides of the cartons to achieve faster freezing. Cardboard cartons should be secured with filament tape, numbering the containers in sequence. The sequential numbers will be taken from your log form, which shows the range, section, and shelf from which the material was taken. Affix a label to the side of each container and put transparent tape over each label to secure it. Containers should be put onto wooden pallets in the truck. In the event there are only a few containers, they should be secure to prevent tipping over. Pallets facilitate movement of the crates into and out of the truck. The most effective procedure for stabilizing water-damaged library and archival materials is to blast-freeze them to a temperature of minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. This method offers several advantages. It allows time to estimate recovery cost, to coordinate operations, and to clean up the affected areas of the library. Also, materials can be left frozen for an indefinite period of time. Studies have found no evidence of any damage to materials as a result of freezing. Freezing also helps to stabilize water-soluble materials such as inks and dyes, which may disperse during natural drying. Once packed, the material should be transported to a cold storage facility. Then the material should be frozen as soon as possible. Material which is only slightly wet may actually dry in a sophisticated blast freezing facility. As part of your disaster recovery plan, you should contact local cold storage facilities and list their addresses, emergency phone numbers, and the rates they'll charge. Materials must be kept frozen until arrangements can be made for their transfer to a vacuum freeze drying facility. Frozen materials must be transported by refrigerated truck from the freezer to the facility where they will be vacuum freeze dried if the trip will take longer than 30 minutes. Make the transport arrangements to the cold storage and vacuum drying facility a part of your recovery plan. Vacuum freeze drying causes water to pass from a frozen to a vapor state without returning to the liquid form. In vacuum drying, the water goes from a frozen state back to a thawed liquid state and then dries. Vacuum drying is slower and generally leaves some distortion of the material. Freezing and then vacuum freeze drying also lessens stains and helps to reduce the odor caused by smoke. In addition, the vacuum freeze dry method eliminates most distortion of materials. It should be emphasized that the best system is the more sophisticated vacuum freeze dry method. The technical guidance of a trained conservator is important during the vacuum freeze drying process and the subsequent reacclimation period, which can take anywhere from two to four weeks in an atmosphere of approximately 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity. Once this process is completed, an assessment can be made to determine if the material requires repair, restoration, rebinding, etc. Natural drying can be used when the quantity of material affected is not great enough to warrant freezing and the vacuum freeze drying method, or if the material is only slightly wet or damp. This procedure should be undertaken with the guidance of a trained conservator. This guidance can either be in person or by telephone, depending on the circumstances. A list of conservators in your area can be obtained by calling the American Institute for Conservation in Washington, D.C. Additional information and assistance can be obtained from the Conservation Office of the Library of Congress, the Northeast Document Conservation Center in Andover, Massachusetts, American Freeze Dry Incorporated Audubon, New Jersey, and Document Reprocessors San Francisco. These and additional resources are listed in your manual. Another excellent resource is the Library of Congress's procedures for salvage of water damaged library materials. This covers both freezing, vacuum drying, and air drying of materials, and has a brief section dealing with the salvaging of photographic material. 
A list of supplies needed for air drying and freezing is included in the accompanying manual. After all water damage materials have been removed from the disaster site, dry portions of the collection should be removed from the wet area. All floors, ceilings, walls, shelves, and other surfaces contaminated by water and or smoke should be thoroughly scrubbed with liquid Lysol or borax and water. One cup of borax to a gallon of water. Extreme care must be exercised if a mold inhibitor such as thymol or formalin are to be used. There is a divergence of opinion regarding the treatment of water damaged photographic materials. It is imperative, however, to keep water damaged photographic material wet and to seek advice and assistance immediately. Materials can be kept wet by putting them into plastic bags. In the case of large quantities of microfilm, the material can be put into plastic trash bags, placed into plastic, not metal, trash cans, and then pour cold water, preferably distilled, into the bags. Tie the bags to prevent spillage. Kodak and Polaroid will offer definitive information, but will generally only offer actual assistance to users of their products. With this in mind, you should contact the manufacturer of your particular product and find out what they advise and will do for you in the event of damage. Ask for customer service. You should also contact local film processors and ask to speak with a photo specialist or processing lab manager. This should be an important part of your pre-planning. And you should not wait until disaster strikes. Definitive information and assistance can be obtained by calling the Eastman Kodak Company Photo Information Group. In addition, Kodak can reprocess water damage microfilm in their Chicago lab. Polaroid maintains a data recovery service for damaged floppy disks. They also have a technical hotline. And another source, the Library of Congress. These and other resources are listed in your manual. Freezing of film may be an option in certain circumstances. However, no action should be taken without consulting a conservator. These and additional resources are listed in your manual. Librarians and archivists are grossly negligent if they allow themselves to believe that they can sail through an entire career without encountering a natural or man-made disaster. It is imperative to be adequately prepared to cope with the disaster. Pre-planning and the establishment of preventative measures will not guarantee immunity from damage by fire and water, but will reduce the probability. In addition, pre-planning will facilitate your ability to salvage materials that may otherwise be lost through negligence or the inability to react quickly. In summary, do, do talk to risk managers to be sure that you are adequately protected and insured that you have taken all necessary precautions to avoid the possibility of fire and water damage. Establish a written disaster recovery plan. Refer to the manual for information to include in your plan. Once the plan is established, choose a recovery team and keep the team informed regarding their involvement in the plan. Be certain each member of the team keeps a copy of the plan and a list of other members at home. Choose key personnel who will be responsible for carrying out the plan and who will notify recovery team members, plumbers, electricians, etc., in the event of a disaster. Brief fire, police, and other personnel such as building security, plumbers, electricians, etc. Review video and plan regularly. Update your plan annually. Do alphanumerically number stack areas. The stack should be numbered, lettered, and keyed to a master plan of the whole stack area. This allows the staff to readily identify the affected areas in the event of a disaster. Keep some disaster recovery supplies stored off-site. Do not attempt to open a wet book. Do not attempt to separate single sheets. Do not attempt any cleaning or restoration. Do not remove covers from water-soaked books. In addition, do not press books or documents when they're water-soaked. Again, establish a disaster recovery plan, review and update this plan annually. Keep the plan, this video, and the manual in a safe location. In the event of a disaster, follow your plan, consult experts, proceed with deliberate caution. 
Remember, disasters can happen to anyone, and the recovery of collections following a disaster can be difficult and costly. However, those who have experienced water or fire damage understand the importance of preventing disaster. Forthright planning can expedite recovery should water damage or fire occur. The choice, it's up to you. Thank you.